you for that lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Abundant Life. I'm Chad Ripley, the pastor here. I'm so glad you're with us, whether you're in the building or worshiping with us online. I'm glad that you're here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come and fill this place, that your will would be done, that your purpose would be accomplished, that you would speak to us and give us ears to hear. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A couple songs into the worship. I'm going to move to that side of the room in case somebody needs prayer this morning. I'd be happy to pray with you. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn. Thank you. 
the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives us power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weary, weak, and tired and young. Men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Even from glory to God. 
we thank you, Lord, that you do your work on earth, yoked together with us. Yes, that Lord. is oh, astonishing oh, that you would choose to carry out your will with us and through yes. us, yoked together. Thank you, God. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we ask that you would use us, that you would fill us with your joy, with your peace, and with your love for other people, that you would send us out to bring people into you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, Sharon Ripley is going to be sharing on taking your place in the spirit, the dominion mandate. Is this about where I usually go? <laughs> right here. That's good. Very good. Welcome. Uh. Can adjust this direction if you want. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Welcome back to class. I missed class last Sunday. I'd rather be here than what I was doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate your prayers, Vern. I'm glad you're feeling better. I understand you were feeling sick while I was out of pocket too. Um, every time, almost every time. You see this particular plastic podium here, it means we're in class. It's not a sermon, don't expect a sermon. This is teaching, and you're responsible for the lesson. So when you're handed out a lesson, you have the choice to either just do whatever you can glean today in a short period of time, good to see you back, uh, or to highlight your stuff Pay attention to what you want to see later and take it home and use it so it becomes something real in your life. This is part two of taking our place in the spirit, the domain and mandate. So I'm just going to review just a little bit of what, what, happened, what happened in the first one. There are five copies of the first lesson, taking your part in the spirit, lesson one. Uh, and that's for anybody who wants that as a backdrop to what you're going to get today. This is the dominion mandate. Okay, we started with lesson one with Isaiah 51, 14 through 16 and 17a. And this is what it says. The exile or the one who's in chains will soon be set free and will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. <clears throat> for I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I've put my words in your mouth and I've covered you with the shadow of my hand to plant the heavens, to found the earth, and to say to Zion, you are my people, rouse yourself, rouse yourself. We saw that the Lord was the Lord of hosts. He was being depicted as Jesus, the mightiest warrior, all-powerful king. He stands ready to intervene in the lives of his people. We're living in unprecedented times in today's world. It would seem that in the natural, things are out of control and spinning into a chaotic state in the national and international scene, as well as for many individuals on a personal level. In the lessons to come, we're going to see God's strategy and his answer. When God was ready to change the culture and climate of anything, he began by positioning a prophetic voice. 
all of us who are in Christ are to use the prophetic unction of the Holy Spirit and declare what God declares. Those are our decrees. So now we're going to go to lesson two, the dominion mandate. Does everybody have a lesson? Everybody have a marker? Because when I ask you to read something, I want you to read it from your paper or up here. I think it's easier from your paper, OK? So I'd like somebody to read the very first section, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, please. Thank you. Dominion is not a bad word. We have to understand it in balance with scripture. The sons and daughters of God have been given dominion, are meant to subdue the earth according to what God said. Seeds dominate earth. Earth does not dominate seeds. You can plant a seed into the earth and bury it in a dirt grave, but it will resurrect. It will dominate the soil. The seed has dominion over the earth. It will overcome what buries it, and it will break out. I would like to have one of these lights out, please, for the PowerPoint. It's a highly significant thing that God said first to Adam and Eve, I want you to rule the earth for me. I'm authorizing you to govern. Societies will need government. See to it. Plant my word everywhere, and dominion will be activated. He didn't accidentally say that a part of your purpose is to govern. It was his will for his children to rule and reign on the earth. Hell has done everything it can to distort God's purpose so that hell's kingdom, not God's kingdom, can rule the earth. Jesus' death and resurrection reactivated God's original intent for his born-again ones. He restored lost purpose and purposes. He reactivated the dominion mandate. God has not changed his mind. That's awesome. His purpose still stands. So what he's saying in Matthew 28, 18, in, the, in other words, he's saying, now you reign in my name. All authority has been given to me. I delegate it to you. Now you rule, you reign, you govern, you have dominion. In the dominion mandate, God said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue is the Hebrew word for kabash. And it means to conquer, rule, and bring into subjection. Dominion is the Hebrew word radah. And it means to rule, to reign in life through Jesus Christ. Clearly, highlight some of this, y'all. Clearly, God wants the earth filled with those made in his image who would bring the earth under the influence of his kingdom. He wants a kingdom. He wants his sons and daughters ruling with him, walking in right relationship with him, and exercising their delegated authority on the earth, not only in a spiritual dimension. The word for earth in Hebrew is Eretz, and it means land, country, fields, nations, physical planet, territory. God wants us to rule territories, nations, countries, lands, all across the earth. It's time to rule and reign with Christ in this life, governing by declaring, cultivating, and making a stand for God's word. I was so blessed by the word that God gave Tammy when she's teaching on prayer a couple Sundays ago, was it? Where he said God had told her, our prayers are formidable. They're forceful words. From our perspective, we don't see how it can be so powerful. We're little, we're whatever. Not in God's sight. We're planting the heavens so that the earth will be founded in a way that pleases God. We're on page two. Jesus is a king. He has a kingdom. He rules the territory. His rule is boundless. His domain is everywhere in heaven and upon earth. He rules hell itself because the keys are his. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He spoke that word in the present tense. So that must mean that he is king of heaven and he is king of earth right now. How does it work? I would highlight that next little paragraph right about the middle of your page. 
It works through his kingdom, exosia, which is his body. The church is Christ's ruling body on earth. Remember from Romans 8, 17, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We're identical heirs with Christ right now, and in his name we are to rule on the earth. Yes, we're going to rule with him through eternity, but he needs us to reign with him now as well. Isaiah 9, 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He came to build a kingdom that would represent him on the earth, a spiritual kingdom that would visibly affect the earth. Satan fights the message of the kingdom. He doesn't want us reigning with Christ in this life. He doesn't want us exercising dominion. He wants us to be ignorant. I can't stand it. Through prayer decrees and planting God's word seeds, he expects his joint heirs to keep good foundations maintained upon the earth so that government can be built on a solid social structure. He expects us to forbid some things and permit some things in his name. He expects his influence to enter into a culture and change that culture through his born-again ones teaching exactly what he says. The church is Christ's ruling body on earth. Would somebody read Matthew 4, 23 through 24, please? And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed. Paralytics, epileptics, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Thank you. Muffet's translation reads, and I highlighted this because it's so cool. <laughs> he made a tour through all the whole of Galilee, preaching the gospel of the rain. Not one time in Scripture do we see him saying, "I'm preaching the gospel of salvation." Not one time. He's always preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which includes salvation. There's a big difference. Page three. The, this is the middle of the page. The first century church filled Jerusalem with their teaching and in 300 years dominated the Roman Empire, the same empire that killed many of the apostles. These Christians laid a foundation beneath Western European countries that made them the most prosperous nations in the world. The call to go into all the world is not just a geographic call to missionaries. It's a vocational call to go into all the systems of this world and impact the culture and do business on great waters. This is a vision that God gave Pastor Gerald. That's why he was so often orchestrating and organizing different parts of the, of the church in the city to deal with the different systems whether it's education or media or entertainment, whatever, so that Christians would infiltrate each of those places. That's what God's plan is for us to make a difference, not to sit here being politically correct. Jesus is the most unpolitically correct person there ever existed because he spoke truth. <clears throat> the word Jesus used for church is ecclesia. That's... Three paragraphs from the bottom on page three. It's been translated church 113 times in the New Testament. It is not a, ecclesia is not a religious word. It's a political, judicial, governmental word. Jesus, the disciples, and the apostles used ecclesia to describe the church. The word never meant a building or a specific place of worship. The English word church did not appear in the New Testament translations until 1557 in the Geneva New Testament. It was the first time the word church was ever used, 1,500 years after Christ. Until then, ecclesia was translated as assembly, congregation, assembly of called out ones, or especially assembled ones. This word church was invented to represent certain religious orders that were governed by a hierarchy. 
turn to page four. The king of England at the time was King James. He liked the word church and he was fond of hierarchies. In his 1611, he ordered the King James Authorized Version to be written with 15 rules to which the translators were bound. One of those rules was that the New Testament Greek word ekklesia always be translated with the English word church. And the rule stuck in other translations from then on. The distinction between an ecclesia, an assembly or group of people, and a church, a location with a building with probably some people in it, that is a subtle but very dangerous confusion that has caused most people today to hear church and think place, not kingdom. Hell's definition confines the most powerful governing body on the earth, the ecclesia, to within the walls of a building on Sunday morning. By the way, I do love the word church. It's a good English word. It fits, but it's important we understand originally what it was supposed to mean, ecclesia. I went looking, I went looking in several um, Hebrew, Greek, study things, looking for the word church to have it translated as church, a building, a people under a hierarchy. Not, could not even find it. All it is is ecclesia. It's an assembly. It's a congregation. It's a con con convening of God's people exercising authority. That's why unbelievers can't do it. Ecclesia is from two Greek words. Ek means out. Kaleo means to call out. It means to be called out and assembled for a purpose. The word ecclesia first occurred in the 5th century, 500 years before Christ. It was describing those with a final say in the Greek government. The definition in classical Greek is an assembly of citizens summoned by the town crier to legislative assembly at the gate. The gate is where people of authority sat. It would be similar to our city building where the mayor and the city council do business. Citizens 18 years of age and up could answer the call to gather and assemble to pass legislation, always with an upraised hand. It meant at regular intervals, but it could also be called quickly in case of emergency. An ecclesia has a sphere of competence. So it decides on laws. Jesus is saying, my ecclesia is to have a final decision on laws in the nation and the region. It has appointments to official appointments. He is saying, we may not be the ones sitting in the judge seat, but we are responsible to make sure who gets there. Both internal and external policies, contracts, treaties, war, financial matters, all to be decided by the ecclesia. Jesus knew what the word ecclesia meant. He understood it very well. They would rule in cases of treason. So if somebody was involved in treason, they would be brought before the ecclesia. They would vote and decide on their guilt or their innocence. The ecclesia also could command the military. They ruled a society on cultural matters for geographical location or territory. Jesus intends for his, his ecclesia to set the cultural standards for regions, not have the culture set the standards for the church. We're on page five. The ecclesia chose by upraised hands who would sit at the Areopagus, the high court of Athens. The high court there was similar to our Supreme Court today. Notice the ecclesia was not the high court. It was the assembly of the people, but it decided who would be on the high court. So those in the Areopagus were selected by the ecclesia. The ecclesia remained the final authority. So, for example, the high court, Areopagus, could investigate uh, corruption or treason, but then that decision would have to be given to the ecclesia to decide. The decisions of government were up to those who answered the call to assemble and rule, and that's why we teach that we need to vote on elections. It's our responsibility commanded by our king. Today, the media tries to decide who holds official positions and who sits on the Supreme Court. The media promotes godless ways, spins new philosophies, tells the church to be quiet. They've stolen the authority of the Areopagus, and we must not allow it. 
Paul stood before the Areopagus. And he said, I see you've got lots of gods. And I see that you have one inscribed as a god nobody knows. He said, I'm here to introduce you to the god so you can worship intelligently and know who you're dealing with. In ancient Greek terms, he preached a sermon about Jesus Christ at the Supreme Court. He did not stay out of the judicial system. He exercised his God-given authority to speak into it. He raised his hand. The Romans were the governing power at the time that Jesus made the statement about his ecclesia. They also had ecclesias. In fact, all of Israel was under the Roman ecclesia. The disciples knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he says, I have built my ecclesia. You are my Congress on earth. He, they knew it. Their goal for the Romans, their goal as an ecclesia was to make every promise that they took over look like Rome. So they'd say, here's what the culture is going to be looking like. This is what you're allowed to do. Here is what you will be taught. This is what you're allowed to teach. The, they administered laws, societal standards, and taxes. The goal was to make that province like Rome. The Jewish people were under Roman ecclesia, and Jesus was aware of it. So on page 6, we now have a more complete context for what Jesus is saying when we see what ecclesia meant at the time, and we see that the first mention of church is within the context of the kingdom of God. So the contextual definition is this. The kingdom of God's governing, ruling body is the ecclesia established by King Jesus to look after his kingdom on earth. Every kingdom has six distinct identifying areas. They have a king. Jesus is our king. They have geographical boundaries. Our kingdom also does. It's everywhere. They have laws and commands. Our constitution is the word of God, the Bible. They have a society or culture that shapes it. Ours is in our hearts, transmitted there by the Holy Spirit who governs our conscience. It's a political government. It legislates and has standards it maintains. If you are part of any Christian effort that has no standards, it is not part of his kingdom. It has an economy. Ours is called tithes and offerings. By using the word ecclesia, Jesus calls his followers the new congress of his kingdom. Jesus said believers are to come together and they are to rule with him in his name on the earth. Every word for church in scripture is a political word, a ruling body, a governing body, a legislative body. It is a congress. Jesus says to believers, you might not be the judge who sits on the bench, but you make sure you decide who does. Make sure you decide who it is by publicly voting on it. Be vocal. You're God's ruling body, so act on it. The world has said repeatedly, church, you stay out of politics. They're going to say it more and more through today's media, but Jesus said, church, you're an ecclesia. You're on earth to be in my Congress. The first settlers of Jamestown went ashore on April 29, 1607, for the express purpose of dedicating the continent to the glory of God. In anticipating this moment, they brought with them a seven-foot wooden cross. And when they landed, they planted it in the sand, and they worshiped and had their first service on Virginia soil. Reverend Robert Hunt, who dedicated the land to the glory of God, said, from these very shores, the gospel shall go forth to not only this new world, but the entire world. On September 16, 1620, after two failed attempts, 102 passengers embarked on a grueling 10-week journey from England to the new world. The ship was the Mayflower, and it was heading for Virginia. Its passengers, the colonists, were half religious separatists, half entrepreneurs. The religious half was Puritans, fleeing from religious persecution at the hands of King James I of England. This was, in fact, a church relocation project. After 66 days at sea, they didn't arrive in Virginia. Instead, they were in Massachusetts. To prevent an uprising, the pilgrims determined that they needed to establish their own government. And before anyone disparked the Mayflower, they created an agreement a type of social contract called the Mayflower Compact. It bound the signers to a civil body politic 
a group of citizens acting together as a lawmaking body. The Mayflower Compact was the very first time the idea of self-government was expressed in the world, and this was a powerful seed planted in the soil. They wrote the Mayflower Compact. I would like somebody to read that portion of the Mayflower Compact, and here it is. So if somebody would read that, it's in the middle of page 7. Thank you. On November 21st, 1620, the compact was signed. It has been designated as the first real constitution of modern times. They were acting as an ecclesia. Last time we had class, we studied the eight steps to thinking biblically. The cultural mandate of the scriptures is that the church is called to be the moral center of the culture, the backbone of its laws by influencing every discipline and jurisdiction with a biblical worldview. Please highlight that. I mentioned last time I was teaching that we got excited when more Christians were voting and it made no difference at all because they did not have a biblical worldview. They voted just like the world. We have been authorized in Jesus' name. We have been called to that purpose. We will never have a utopia upon this planet until Jesus comes back, but we can affect the world and its governance, and we are expected to do so. We are under the authority, the lordship of King Jesus, forgiven, re-imaged, and born again into his family. We truly are in the king's lineage. We are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ. We are part of the kingdom of Almighty God and are expected to reign with him right now. Jesus said, the kingdom is here. It is at hand. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Using the original Greek word meanings, it says, I would highlight this, y'all, page 7 at the bottom, I have authorized that whenever and wherever my ecclesia encounters hell's counsel or authority, you are to prevail against it. You will then face the decision whether you will or will not bind it. <clears throat> what transpires is determined by your response. If you do purposely and consciously involve yourself in binding the issue on earth, you will find that it has been bound in heaven. If we say yes, it's been yes in heaven. If we say no, it's been no in heaven. In other words, authority he's delegated to us is backed up in heaven. Keys represent authority in scripture. If you have the keys to something, you have authority over it. You can open it. You can close it. You've been given authority in Christ's name to open doors and close doors. We've been given authority to bind things and to loose things. That's exactly what God is releasing through, through Tammy for our declarations that we stand on and we pray and declare every single week. We are binding things and loosing things. We are forbidding things that are not author authorized by King Jesus. We're permitting things that are authorized by him. <coughs> we have the authority to forbid or permit. This authority has been handed to his ecclesia. The church that does this is a glorious church. It's time we answer the commissioning of King Jesus and confidently release authority language on the earth. Eliphaz in the book of Job says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Highlight the next little paragraph. We are not here to be ruled by unrighteousness. That makes no sense. We've been legally established as ruling ones given authority by our God. We are heirs now, and we are de to declare the word of King Jesus on earth, uncompromised. We are not to make it politically correct. We are to say what he says. Jesus spoke differently. His language is powerful. His words were weighty. His sentences were not filled with unbelief. He didn't contradict himself. 
saying one thing one minute and something else the next. His words were positive, sure, decisive, confident, and bold. He spoke kingly language. In John 7, it says, never has a man spoken this way. In Matthew 7, it says, he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Matthew 8, Jesus didn't say to the leper who wanted to be clean, he said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not really feeling it today. I don't think I'll try. Luke 7, he approached a widow who had just lost her son, was leading a funeral procession. He could have just let them go by. Instead, he spoke with authority to the young man, rise, and he got up. John 9, he didn't tell a man who was born blind, blindness is too hard for me to heal. He spoke with authority, and vision came into those blind eyes. He didn't tell Lazarus, sisters, Mary, Martha, sorry about your brother, there's nothing I can do. In Luke 4, it says, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. The word for power there is exousia. It's a word for authority, force, forceful, competence, strength, and influence. It denotes right and might. It refers to a potentate who rules a, a territory or magistrate's jurisdiction. <coughs> Greek scholar Spiros Zodiati defined exousia as to speak as one in control or to speak as one who has the right to do something. Jesus talked as though he was authorized. He used his words to influence. He spoke like a potentate, like a magistrate who knew his jurisdiction. Kings talk differently. Their speech resonates authority. They carry themselves with authority. It's time for a remnant bride to begin to carry herself with authority, knowing that a yes on earth is a yes in heaven and a no on earth is a no in heaven. The Holy Spirit and angel armies are backing it up. Jesus' words are living and active. They're powerful. He uses his words to rule and reign in this life on the earth, and as joint heirs were to do the same. The early church understood this. They spoke the king's language. Jesus said his words wouldn't pass away. He says, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. <clears throat> and in, in Acts 4, they're praying and say, grant to your bondservants to speak your word with all boldness. That word for boldness there. It's parousia, and it means outspokenness, frankness, commanding words and commands. It's actually a military word, and it concerns generals and leaders. Generals have, uh, are given command of troops. Parousia, the paw part, means way or manner, and reo means speak, command, say. The apostles understood that how they talked mattered. Grant us boldness to make king commands. Give us freedom to be outspoken for a king. Give us boldness to command healings and miracles in the name of Jesus. As kings under King uh, Christ's command, anoint us to talk like household kings, like generals giving authoritative commands. Anoint us to rule like kings in this life, giving us boldness to live in our lives, out our lives like God's kids. Father, because I'm a joint heir with Jesus, in his name I rise to plant the heavens and earth and faith decrees aligned with your word. On page 10 and 11 and part of 12, those are decrees that you can take to the Lord, decide with you and the Holy Spirit which ones of these he wants you to do. Where are you going to take authority? What are you standing on? What's he saying? Every single one of us is a leader in our jurisdiction. Leadership looks different depending on where your leadership is, but every person who has anybody in their relationship and they have either kids or family or friends or whatever, if God has given you jurisdiction because you're the believer in the situation, you have jurisdiction to claim all kinds of stuff on their behalf. Okay, so we're going to turn to quickly page 12. Decrees create. They can create ideas in your heart. They create things that are not seen with the natural eye. They can create changes in conditions and in the atmosphere, physically, spiritually, emotionally, materially, governmentally, politically, vocationally, provisionally. Decrees are a creative force. Isaiah 42.9 says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. 
Now I declare new things. Before they sprout or before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Notice that God says, I declare them before they spring forth. I pronounce them before they ever are. So he says, I announce them, I declare without negation first so that they can be seen. Highlight the next little paragraph. We're on page 12, about a, three inches from the bottom. First comes a decree, a declared word that he will not change or negate. Then it springs forth and materializes. It doesn't materialize until there is a decree. That is what Hebrews 11.1 1 is about. Faith decreed becomes substantive. Faith-filled words materialize if you don't negate them. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word before in Isaiah 42.9 is the Hebrew word terim, and it means suspended in time, not yet occurred. So God is saying, while it's... While its existence is suspended in time, while it has not yet occurred, I decree it. The two words spring forth are from one Hebrew word, sama, and it's an agriculture word that means to sprout, to bud, to grow to fullness. It first sprouts, then it buds, and then it finally grows to fullness when it's decreed and planted. The word tell is the Hebrew word shama, and it means to sound a message to something, to announce something, to proclaim it or voice it. So before it occurs, announce it. And then don't go home and say, well, I didn't really mean that. You just negated it. When it's in suspended in time, while it has not yet occurred, you have to announce it. It will never produce what it is if you don't plant it and decree it. You, you, you get a, a sense of the laws of the kingdom are different from the laws of this world. We've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of the son of his love, and he's got rules there. He's got laws of faith that will not operate any other way, whether we like it or not. We're not comfortable with decreeing at first and, and we don't see it yet. Would somebody please read Romans 4, 17 through 21 on page 13. Thank you. In this passage, Paul's talking about words of faith that create, they produce promises, they change things. Sometimes someone who believes for promises, but I don't see any evidence of this. Exactly, that's the point. You don't see any evidence because it's suspended in time. It doesn't exist yet. Quit looking at that. You can't see evidence until you plant a decree. But people say, well, if I said that, then I'm lying. No, you are not lying. You are creating. Don't negate it. Create it. In the beginning, God didn't see trees and then tell about us about trees. While they were suspended in time, he said, be, and they sprang forth. True faith calls it done in Jesus' name. And then the promises can sprout, bud, and grow to fullness. What seems impossible becomes possible, ready to be watered by our faith and brought to fullness. The New English translation reads, God who makes the dead alive and summons the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. He summons or calls them. This is the best translation of this verse. That is what the Greek text, text, text describes. Decrees 
summon something to come to you. Authority language summons what does not yet exist to come to you. It speaks of it being done. The Living Bible reads, God speaks of future events with as much certainty as though they were already past. And then it says, God calls those things that be not as though they were. Calls is the Greek word kaleo, and it means to say out loud, to bid, to call something near you, to summon. The phrase, those things, is translated from one Greek word in the original text, usa, and it means to be, being. Primarily, it means to come. So when you put the two together, kaleo usa means come here or come to me. In verse 17, not is the Greek word me, and it means no existence, nothing to deny. Faith says to things that have no existence, come here, come here now. Faith summons them. It says to promises that demons are trying to deny, come here, it commands demons, you go take your barriers down, and I summon the promise to come to me. In Jesus' name, we are to boldly decree, th decree things that are suspended in time, promises that have been f not fulfilled yet, prophecy that has not occurred yet. Come here and manifest to me. There's a testimony for Robert and Chelsea's story. They, they were a young couple. They got married, wanted to have kids right away. and they, it, She got pregnant early. They lost the baby. They were devastated. That night after the miscarriage had been confirmed, <coughs> uh, Rob, I think, was it Robert his name? Yeah. Robert felt a strong urge to go pray. And so he went to the gymnasium where they usually met with the youth, and he was all by himself, just one light on, no music, no nothing. He went there and he sat in silence. He felt like God was saying, pray, get alone with me and pray. So he sat there not knowing what to pray, and he sat there 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 for about an hour. And then one of Pastor Tim's sermons came to mind, no more delay and it started overwhelming his thoughts. He says, this is on page 14, third paragraph down, I stood up and began to decree that very thing. No more delay. I said it over and over and over again. I began to call our son, a child they don't have yet. River, come to me, river. Come to me, come to me, son. Come to me, river. Over and over again. God was present. It was more than just me praying to God. I was speaking to our situation. I was speaking life into our heart's desire and that I, that was to have a son. And when I left, I knew it was as good as done and I would get to meet Little River very soon. A short time later, Chelsea was pregnant again and now they not only have River, who's 10 months old, but they're expecting a second son, Gunner, in just a few months. So thankful for what God has done. Pastor, Stim, Pastor Tim, who is part of what I've written for our resources here, <clears throat> has been given hundreds of prophetic words over the years and uses this principle constantly declaring, you come to me and you materialize. You will come here and you will materialize. You are going to take on substance and you are going to grow to fullness. You cannot stay away from me. You, have, you come here, you come here, you come here, and you come to me. As believers, we, begin, we need to begin to declare, come here and come here now. To promises that hell's kingdom may be denying you, you've got to start saying with bold authority, come here, come to me, healing. Come to me, finances. Come to me, new job. Come to me, manifest. Take on substance. Sprout, bud, grow. I am not going to make this command negative any longer. I'm not canceling. In Jesus' name, you come here and do not delay. You can easily see that the commanding authority language that we're supposed to be walking in is not something we're used to. Decree the promise is yours. Proclaim the promise is yours and don't negate it. The apostolic teaching is clear from Romans 4.17 and the Greek text, text rendering is very authoritative. The Greek says, bid come here to things still to be or to rights that are being denied you. Do so in this manner. Do it this way. In Jesus' name, come here and come here right now. Materialize for me. That's a powerful faith decree. It may take us a while to get the revelation of our promise. Abraham had to hold fast to the promise for a long, long time. Page 15, the Greek for hold fast is the word kadego, 
and it's the word that means down, down in your spirit, your gut's in your middle. And echo is the Greek origin of the English word echo, meaning to hear over and over again. So you don't shout a word and have the echo repeating different words. No, it's the same word time after time. Abraham echoed the promise of God over and over again. He held fast. He literally said to a non-existent son who had been suspended in time, come here, come here, and manifest. You come here and you materialize for me. He said it until verse 21 says he became fully, fully persuaded. The word for staggered not is the Greek word dekarino, and it means to separate, to withdraw. In other words, he did not oppose God's promise in his mind. He refused to go there. Katanoiko means from the root noose, and these definitions remind us of the English word for noose, something that strangles the life out of you. Don't let negative words hang you. They will stifle creative abilities that you rightfully have as an heir. Abraham just kept saying, come here, come here, come here. Hebrew, com Hebrew commentators tell us he actually did this out loud. It's really a long time to believe for a son. Before Isaac was conceived, before he knew his name, Abram began decreeing his faith. When Abram was 55 years old, God promised him children. Again, at 70 years, the promise was repeated. When he was 86 years old, Ishmael was born. And when he was 99 years old and Ishmael was 13, God changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarah's name to Sarah and told Abraham to be circumcised. And from that point on, the male children had to be circumcised on the eighth day. So he'd been promising children for a long time. He immediately obeyed and had every male circumcised, including himself. Uh, the third day, as Abraham was recovering from the circumcision, he went outside to enjoy the sunshine, and the Lord visited him and predicted that Sarah would have a son, and they were to call him Isaac. He was born when Abraham was 100 years old. So the very last paragraph there, many today have promises suspended in time that have not occurred yet, but were to say to those promises, come here, and then don't negate it. If the people of God would dare to do what he has said and begin to declare, come here, we would see great creative promises begin to spring up all over the place. But so often negative words come to our minds and go out of our mouths, surround our necks, and strangle the life out of our faith. Romans 4.21 says he became fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. Fully persuaded is the Greek word and that means to convince or win over with words. God won Abraham over with his words. We could say that he spoke winning words to Abraham. It, this word implies that Abraham spoke it back to him. It's an echo. And so when God speaks words to us, and we receive them, those are his kind words to us, to stir up faith for that. And as we respond it back to him, we're echoing it back to him, we're speaking winning words back to God, and this is going to come to pass. So whatever he's saying to us, we repeat back to him and choose to stand there and believe for that. Verses that we're not going to go into, but it's for your, your study, is 17 and 18. These are scriptures on the kingdom. It's amazing what it got. And there's so many other things on the kingdom. Before we stop here now, I'd like you to bow your head, and I'd like to speak this blessing over you. And I ask you to just receive it in the name of Jesus, OK? because no word from God will ever fail. May God himself wrap you up in his new mercies this day. Where you've known angst, may he give you awe-inspiring wonder. Where you've known heartbreak, may he bring healing, deliverance, and a supernatural breakthrough. May he help you blow the dust off your dreams and lift them up as a possibility again. With God, all things are possible. May you learn to pray from that beautiful truth. Be lifted up today. He's got you. Amen. I wanted to bring these um, just to show you. This is, the, this is the result of Christians, many Christians, and not all, but many. Most of them were, were believers, the founding fathers. This is what the ecclesia performed. This is because an ecclesia was performing Christians were standing up and making a difference for our country. And so we have the Mayfall Compact. We have, we, we have all that. We have Patrick Henry saying, give me liberty or death. We have the Declaration of Independence. We have the Constitution of the United States. 
We have the ordinance of 1787, which is what they wrote up to decide what to do about states that were going to join in, and they took it from Jefferson's uh, information. And we have the Bill of Rights, which is the amendments that made to the Constitution several years later to make sure and clarify what was already listed in the Constitution to make sure that we could be a nation under God. This is what an ecclesia has done for this country. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It has gotten to where anywhere I go, I pray. And I've got a long time to do that since I live out at Medina Lake. There's no place close to me. But I pray when I go to a board meeting. This week I had one where I knew there was contention, there was disagreement. I prayed for peace. I prayed for unity. I prayed that God's kingdom would advance. I do that everywhere I go. Two weeks ago, I was invited to give the invocation and benediction at a police officer's cadet graduation as they were sworn in as police officers. And so uh, I was on the way to that, prayed for those young officers, prayed for their families, prayed for the event, prayed against anything that would come against that event, any, any uh, evil that wanted to harass. And I prayed in the spirit. I put on the armor of God, prayed in the spirit, prayed in tongues, uh, rebuked evil that might come against that, and prayed that Jesus' kingdom would advance. And so when I got there, I was sitting with the chief of police, I was sitting with the city manager, with city council members, command staff of the San Antonio Police Department, and was asked to pray. And when I had prayed, I sat back down and and the uh, stadium erupted in applause. The city manager looked at me and said, they're clapping after the prayer. That never happens. <laughs> that, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, the chief did tell me, well, there was one other time. <laughs> but we, we look for success. I expect success, not, not for me but for the kingdom of God. I expect that to advance. This weekend, we had a, a dinner for two classes of police cadets, and it was to introduce them to the chaplains. It was to pray for them. It was to talk to them about family life and police work, what that's going to be like. This church spent $100 on that out of the chaplain's fund that we have here. The dinner cost between five and 6000 That was donated. It was at a fancy hotel. It was a dinner that was so fancy that the waiters in tuxedos would put a napkin, a cloth napkin, on your lap before they served you. The salad was so fancy, I can't tell you what was in it. <laughs> and it was filet mignon. We paid $100 for a five or $6,000 event. We were able to pray for the cadets introduce ourselves as chaplains for the department, talk about the resources available to them, speak to their spouses, to their family members about what police work is like. God's kingdom is advancing. He is not limited by finances. He's not limited by anything. And I've prayed that wherever I go, God's kingdom would advance. And that's what I pray for each one of you that wherever you go, God's kingdom advances, that no evil would stand in front of you, no evil would claim the day or have dominion in any situation that you're in because you're bringing the power of God with you wherever you go. That's why we go in boldness. We go with courage. We go knowing that Jesus will succeed. So thank you. Now, <laughs> now, on to some announcements. We have the, the women's breakfast and Bible study tomorrow morning at 1030. 
that will be at, at mom's house. So we're looking forward to that. Mom already prayed a blessing on us, so let's stand and, and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, and length, and height, and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. After the service, we'll have people available to pray with you. If you go into this hallway, the first door to your left, we'll have some folks available to pray there. Um, a few weeks ago, we, we mentioned that we had revamped our website. We had a QR code printed on the bulletin. We also have these on business cards. They're on the back at that green table. Take as many as you like, we've got plenty. But if you want to tell somebody, hey, take a look at what our church is all about, you can just scan the code and, and get it right there. And we'll remain standing for our closing hymn. Yeah. Huh.